Well, hard as it may be to believe, Thanksgiving is almost upon us again. Very soon, a little over a week from now, families all across the country will be gathering around the dinner table to enjoy food and family and fellowship and perhaps watch a little football as well. It's a wonderful time. It's always fun to get back together with family, perhaps family that you haven't been able to see in several months, maybe even since last year's Thanksgiving. But also it affords us the opportunity to very consciously reflect on all the things that we're thankful for. Of course, this is something we should be doing year round, being thankful. But when you have a holiday whose title is Thanksgiving, it's, it's at least the best time, if not any other time to put things that you're grateful for in the forefront of your mind. Thanksgiving is not just about gratitude, though, at least in terms of the general idea of just being a thankful person. Thanksgiving has, at its roots as a national holiday, a very spiritual connotation to it. I want to read you something that our first president, George Washington, said very early in his tenure as commander-in-chief. He writes these words, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God. He goes on to say, among those favors is being afforded the opportunity to peacefully establish a form of government for our safety and happiness. So George Washington basically establishes the parameters behind which Thanksgiving was conceived. Uh, Thanksgiving did not become a national, regularly observed holiday until Abraham Lincoln made it such. Um, but it was at least a, a custom that was held for the first hundred years of our nation's existence before it became codified as a national holiday. And there at the very beginning, uh, George Washington, our first president, says this is not just supposed to be a day of thanksgiving, but a day of thanksgiving and prayer. It ought to be a time when we reflect not just to the things that we've received, but to the God who has blessed us with those things. A few verses from the Bible to reflect that idea, one of which is Psalm 105 verse 1 where David says, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the people. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He writes again, Paul does in Colossians 3.15, To let the peace of God rule, he says, in our hearts, to the which also we are called in one body, and be ye thankful. We live, however, in a very thankless world. We live in a world where people often are expecting good things to happen to them. They walk around with a chip on their shoulder and every good thing that happens to them, they assume it should have happened to them already. And if it ever doesn't happen to them, they complain because it should have happened to them already. And so that's not the right attitude that God would have us to hold. God would have us to hold an attitude where we are looking for opportunities to, to bless others. And looking for reasons to be thankful for what we ourselves have been given. It's not about competing with what others have been given and judging whether or not we have more or they have more. But rather it's about taking what we have, finding contentment in it, and praising God for the same. Black Friday is the great big holiday that surrounds Thanksgiving, the day following Thanksgiving when shoppers will gather in supermarkets and superstores and big box retail outlets all across the country. And everything that they learned the day before will go right out the window. And instead of being grateful for what they have, they will push and shove and kick and bite and punch and scream in order to get more, more, more things. It is, it is, if not sad, hilariously ironic, the contrast between Thanksgiving Day and Black Friday. And so we have a very uh, conflicted culture that we live in. One in which wants to celebrate Thanksgiving, but really has kind of forgotten how. Wants to be grateful and wants to be thankful, but is too consumed with things to really appreciate what it already has been given. So let's take a few moments and just consider what the Bible says about Thanksgiving. Really from this perspective, let's, let's consider the therapy of Thanksgiving. Because I don't know if you've noticed, as I've noticed, but this country around us is a little on edge. We're a little antsy, we're a little, uh, we're a little edgy, we're a little quick to anger, 
we just need to mellow out and relax a little bit. And I think the best way to do that is for us just to enjoy the therapeutic nature of Thanksgiving. Not necessarily the holiday Thanksgiving, but just the giving of thanks and how it has a very therapeutic uh, connotation to it. To do that, let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. And let's notice verses 4 through 7, where Paul writes these words, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the God of peace, which and the God and God will provide you a peace which passes understanding, and will keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving is a therapeutic thing, if done with a godly attitude, because it produces the right kind of praise that we need to have a calm and peaceful heart. Notice that Paul opens that little text in Philippians 4.4 4 by telling us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. The praisefulness of rejoicing is what we're considering here. When you have joy, it's an internal thing. When you rejoice, you express the internal joy outwardly. And Paul doubles down on emphasizing the, the need for us to express our joy outwardly. We can have happiness inside, we can have joy on the inside, but if we don't show it, it really doesn't do much good. Not only for others, but even for ourselves. There have been studies that have been shown to prove that a person who is feeling bad and sad can make themselves happy by smiling even when they don't feel like smiling. Just the outward appearance alone e eventually leads someone to feeling happier thoughts. It triggers a chemical reaction in the brain that causes happiness to stir up in the person. So imagine if you were a person who had internal happiness and you just expressed it every now and then. How much greater your happiness and your joy would be. So rejoice in the Lord always. And again, we say rejoice. Rejoicing in the Lord or rejoicing in the Lord is not something we do just on Sundays. It's not something we do just when we gather with our brethren. It should be the, the backbone of our entire lives. It should be a, what everything we do is kind of filtered through. I am going to handle this adversity because I rejoice. I'm going to deal with this hardship because I rejoice. I'm going to enjoy this person's uh, victory at the, my own expense because I can rejoice in all circumstances. And that, when we attain that attitude, produces a very therapeutic response. And we find peace and contentment, the likes of which we may never see without it. This is uh, one of the Psalms that's very appropriate for Thanksgiving time. Psalm 100, five verses says this, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and we're not ourselves. We're his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for because the Lord is good, his mercy everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. This is David telling us not just to reflect intellectually on the fact that we belong to God, but rather to express that fact with, with a positive emotion. Rejoice and joy and make a joyful noise with gladness and with singing and with thanksgiving and being thankful because we belong to God. The therapy of thanksgiving is found when we are praiseworthy in our gratefulness. Second thing that uh, thanksgiving does from a therapeutic standpoint is it reminds us of our place. Now, it produces praise and reminds us of our place, and both of those ideas come from the same verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice where, Paul? In the Lord. Also, to whom I rejoice is to God, but he doesn't say rejoice to the Lord. He says rejoice in the Lord. Put your location in the place of Jesus Christ. Stand in Jesus Christ, in his spiritual body as a Christian, because it is there where you find true joy. It is as a Christian where you can endure the hardships and get through the difficult days and go through the hard uh, sufferings and the, the brutal pain that this world provides. It can only be done by being in Christ, because it is only in Christ that you have perspective and you have hope and you have a reason to endure those things. So don't just rejoice. But as Paul says here, rejoice in the Lord.
That's why it's so important that he calls it rejoicing and not just be happy. And if your Bible says be happy, I would change that to rejoice. That's a different idea entirely. Happiness is circumstantial. If you get a promotion, you're happy. If you get a demotion, you're not happy. If you are, or if you find a hundred dollars, or if you inherit a hundred dollars, let's not say you stole it or anything. If you inherit a hundred dollars, hey, that you're happy. You weren't expecting it. It's a great little thing. If someone steals a hundred dollars from you, you're not happy, and that's perfectly normal to feel not happy. It's okay. It's a natural response. Happiness versus not happiness or sadness. But rejoicing is not about happiness. Rejoicing is irrespective of circumstances. Rejoicing doesn't care if your uh, if your times are good or your times are bad. In both cases, you're told to rejoice. And how is it I'm able to do that? How do I find that kind of perspective? Paul says, rejoice because you are in the Lord. David writes in Psalm 511, put your trust in God and rejoice. He says in Psalm 92, be glad and rejoice in God. He says in Psalm 25, trust in God. In Psalm 35, let your uh, the mercy of God, the hope of God be found in him. In Psalm 56, I will trust in him. In thee we trust. And we say to God, there is no joy without God, no praise without God, no hope without God. It's only with God that we can have those things, and they're only found in Him. Marshall Keeble, the old gospel preacher from a century ago, had an expression where he would take the word Christian, Christ, I-A-N, Christian. And he would say, you take Christ off, and you're, all you're left with this is I-A-N, because without Christ, and then he would say, I ain't nothing. Well, if you take away Jesus Christ and you're no longer in Christ, what reason do you have to rejoice? None. What What is there that could allow you to have a positive attitude in difficult circumstances? None. It is only through Christ that you have those things. And once you have those things, the therapy of that comes through and you find contentment and peace and the ability to endure when those hardships arise. So be in the right place. You'll produce the right praise. The other therapy of Thanksgiving is that and this was kind of hinted at earlier, it, it provides the right perspective. And that is to say, you won't necessarily be coveting and, and desiring greater things and, and having better riches. Those things won't matter. You will have what you have and you'll be fine because you'll have Christ and that is more than enough. That's everything you'll need. We tell our children when they complain that they didn't get something they may have wanted, uh, parents will sometimes say, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Well, that's a Christian concept. Whatever you get, whatever your lot in life, whatever it is, whether good or bad, you rejoice in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in Philippians 4, 5, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Have a moderate attitude. In other words, I don't need more and I don't want less. I have what I have and I'm happy with that. Be moderate. He's, he goes down, uh, goes on to say down in verse 11 of Philippians 4, I'm not talking about wanting because I have learned in whatever state that I am in to be content. What gives Paul contentment? The fact that he's in Christ, which is sufficient. And that's the reason to rejoice. Be content. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't fret over yesterday. Have what you have today and be thankful for it. Once you achieve that, you will find true and genuine peace. A peace that passes understanding. People outside of Christ who try to rationalize and understand and figure out and emulate the, the Christian concept of, of serenity without Jesus, they're never able to do it because the missing component is a spiritual one, not a physical one. You can't grab it and hold it like an amulet or like a, like a charm and have this and therefore you have peace. No, it's spiritual in nature. It's an internal thing. You have Christ, you have peace. I had a philosophy teacher when I was at UCA who spent 45 minutes talking about contentment from a negative standpoint. What's so great about contentment? Why would you want to be content? You should always want more. You should always want more. As if that's the engine that keeps society going. And I understand what he means, but he misses the point entirely. I'm not interested in, in reaching for the next goal. I mean, I, I have aspirations and I have things that I may want to achieve in life, but if I don't achieve them, I'm not going to fret. I'm not going to whine and cry and complain. I'm going to be content um, with, with whatever the blessing is that God has given me. So if I receive a gift and I'm not thankful, then I've missed the point. 
If I receive a gift and I want more, I've missed the point. If I receive a gift and I just forget to even say the word thank you, that implies it's not on the inside and I miss the point. Thanksgiving is not about receiving gifts though. We have Christmas for that. Thanksgiving is about being thankful for what we have been given long term. Not just the immediate, oh, you gave me a gift and I immediately say thank you. It's not that kind of thing. It's more reflective than that. It's not so reactionary as it is contemplative. We reflect on all that we have, all that we've been given, what we've lost, what we've gained over the years, and we just pause to be thankful that we are who we are in the position that we're in to be able to have the blessing and the privilege to even say thank you to God in the first place. And once you achieve that idea, you will achieve the peace which passes understanding. Now, let me say one more thing before we close, because I know this is the time of year that can be very hard for some people. Some people really struggle with Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas, uh, times when families are coming together and people are so full of, of cheer and, and peace. And some people have a lot of misery and they have a lot of sadness. and They've had a lot of hardships sometimes that happen around this time of year and it brings back bitter memories. And I understand that. Uh, you're not necessarily going to be happy this Thanksgiving or this Christmas to come. And that's okay. You don't have to be happy. But as a Christian, we can find reasons to rejoice. We can find something to pull us out of the, the ditch of misery and despair uh, to the brightness and the greatness of what Christ offers us. I hope that for you, if, if it is the case that you're thinking about Thanksgiving uh, as it's upcoming with some sense of dread and you're worried about it and you're anxious about it, I, I hope that you can at least turn to Christ and find the contentment that he offers you, even in your sadness. It's okay to be sad, but in your sadness, find reason to rejoice. If you have Christ, then you have that. For those of us who are looking forward to Thanksgiving and are looking forward to spending time with family and friends and loved ones, and who enjoy the, the give and take of Christmas exchanging gifts and so forth, um, we here at North Heights wish you the very best as this holiday season kicks off. And we hope that you will look for the people who maybe are not feeling so great about this time of year and help them, help them get up out of that ditch and help them to see the reasons to rejoice that we have in Christ. Help them to find genuine Christian thanksgiving as, an, as a lifestyle to hold. Because when we have that, we have the therapy of thanksgiving and how it produces natural praise for what we have, how it reminds us of our place as citizens of Jesus and his kingdom and how it, it produces the right perspective uh, to think, well, I may be sad now, but this world is not all there is. There's something greater over the horizon. God bless you.